80% of renters in this country are living paycheck to paycheck um, with about $400 average in their bank account. About 40% of their income is going to rent. So this is a financially burdened individual that we are trying to help. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay. On this podcast, I interview innovators about their strategies, industries, and decisions. This week, I chat with Mike Rudoy, co-founder and CEO of Jetty. Jetty is a financial services platform that helps make renting at home more affordable and flexible. They offer three products, Jetty Deposit, a service that helps renters with their security deposits, Jetty Rent, a flexible rent payment program, and Jetty Protect, modern renter's insurance. As you can see, there are a few different ways they're helping folks navigate some of the challenges of renting. Now, Interplay is an investor, and Jetty has some other great VCs on the cap table. So I asked Mike how he approached fundraising, and he shared a really insightful tip. During the chat, we discuss Jetty, how Mike chose this sector, the general state of housing in America, and so much more. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Venwise. Venwise is a curated community of high-growth leaders. It's isolating being a leader, but it doesn't have to be. Through Venwise, you can join discussions and gain support from fellow C-level executives at high-growth tech companies. If you're interested, apply by visiting venwise.com. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Very cool. Let's, let's start off. You mind giving us a quick overview of your background? Sure. Just like the 30-second uh, minute version so people have a sense of who you are. Yeah. Um, grew up in Chicago, went to Princeton undergrad, uh, did two years of management consulting at a company called Diamond, which is now part of PwC. Um, I left a couple years out to start my first company. It was called Big Live. It was a live video streaming platform. Um, we were streaming concerts and live um, red carpet events and film premieres, etc. I uh, did that for about four years, raised a bunch of venture capital, had a team out in LA. Um, that business got aqua hired. I came back to New York, um, started up a little consulting shop of my own uh, before getting back into building a venture back business, which ultimately became Jetty. Very awesome. You and I have a lot in common. It's uh, entrepreneurship in the blood. That's right. So, so, you know, we're investors in Jetty. We're obviously a big fan of what you're doing. Would you mind starting off by giving us an overview of the business? Yeah. So we are building the financial services platform for the rental real estate um, economy. Uh, everything that we do is meant to do basically help both sides of the lease. So for property managers, it's all about helping them manage renter risk uh, more effectively. And then ultimately for renters, it's about making their lives as a renter more affordable. We want to be able to get them into the apartments that they want and then ultimately stay in. Um, so to date, we have launched three products, um, two of which are insurance and the third is lending. Um, and all of them can be sold at the point of lease such that it will help you get in. Um, so the first product is called Jetty Deposit. And it is a security deposit replacement. So instead of posting a large security deposit, if you don't have the cash, uh, you can now pay a small monthly fee, gain access to the home that you want. And for a property manager, it's about marketing a cheaper unit and driving occupancy, and also now being able to get the requisite coverage they need to protect themselves from bad debt. We also sell renter's insurance. And our third product, which is new as of this August, is called Jetty Rent. And it is a cousin of buy now, pay later uh, for your rent. So um, think about it as we will pay your rent on the first of the month. We will give renters 24 days to pay us back. Um, and the reason why that's important is because if you are living paycheck to paycheck, or you're in the gig economy, or if you have large bills, and you can't get the money in on the first of the month, you are hit with a large late fee that can oftentimes compound and lead to eviction and abandonment, which is the problem that we're trying to solve for property managers. So those are three examples of products that we have launched. We have a long list of products to go, um, but all of them, again, come back to helping making renting more affordable and helping protect property managers from bad debt. 
Love it. Who do you sell to? Is it is this something where consumers should be looking to sign up or they only sign up after, you know, the renter only signs up after their buildings on it? Who do you sell to? Yeah, the entire business model is b 2 b to c So we ultimately sell to the consumer. So the consumer is purchasing the product. That's how we generate revenue, but it is being sold through relationships with property managers or owners. So without the property manager or owner, we actually can't get in front of the customer. Got it. Okay. And what, you know, you've got these three products. Uh, the one that always catches me is the security deposits. That, you know, I've been in a fortunate life in many ways. It's never been an issue for me. Why is that an important product for a lot of people out there? So we'll start with the problem at hand, which is 80% of renters in this country are living paycheck to paycheck um, with about $400 average in their bank account. About 40% of their income is going to rent. So this is a financially burdened individual that we are trying to help. And ultimately, we are trying to free up liquidity. You can think about Jetty Deposit as a liquidity tool. Um, so instead of paying both the first month of rent and a security deposit, whatever that cost may be, be it a month or maybe half a month, re- regardless, that is a lot of money, especially when you add on moving costs, et cetera. Um, and so you might not be our target audience, actually. Um, right. We are really helping people who need all the financial help they can get. Um, and in many cases, without Jetty Deposit, they would not be able to access their unit. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what happens to a lot of folks now who are paycheck to paycheck when they have a decent-sized security deposit to pay up front? They just don't get a place? They would go to a different place. I see. So that... Is that often one of the bigger financial considerations, a security deposit, more than the monthly rent, or are those kind of way out for folks generally? They're both important, ultimately. Um, so getting in, it's really about the security deposit. Over time, uh, it can be about the rent, um, but usually the property manager will make sure that they're in a financial position such that they could afford the rent. But what begins to happen is because people might have lumpy incomes, or they might have spikes in um, their financial responsibilities, they might not have the cash on hand to smooth that over. Um, And so that's effectively what our new product, Jetty Rent, is designed to do. It's designed to give people the time that they need such that they're not financially penalized um, if, for, for example, one month they have a large bill to pay. And what's the shtick for landlords, building owners? I mean, if they're really the people who have to decide to bring this in-house, why are they adopting? The way in which they're managing, there's a a pitch across each product, and then there's a broader Mm. pitch. The broader pitch is all about reducing, the broader pitch is all about reducing bad debt. Um, So this is about getting rents in on time, making sure that cash flow is there, making sure that you're not evicting people. Um, This is how their business ultimately operates. Um, And when there is too high bad debt, um, it ends up really, really hurting their business. So it's one of the things that they are very, very um, in tune with and trying to reduce. Specifically, Jetty Deposit, in today's world, they are trying to, number one, get people in the unit. They also want to make sure that they're protecting themselves against lost rent someone not paying at the end of a lease, or damage to the unit. That's what our Jetty Deposit product covers. And so if a renter is higher risk, they might not be able to afford the security deposit, and they surely couldn't afford a higher security deposit if they're deemed as a higher risk. And so what our product allows a property manager to do is optimize the amount of coverage for the risk of the renter. So a higher risk renter equals more coverage, a lower risk renter equals less coverage, but the out-of-pocket cost to the renter is going to be less than it would have otherwise been if they were forced to post cash. So that's why we talk about it as a win-win. The property gets the coverage they need, the renter gets the reduced upfront fee. Okay. And we talked about this. There are others, but yes. Yeah, and it gives people a sense of why the landlords are signing up for this. Now, we've talked about it before. Um, 
you guys have a, a mind shift happening. You're shifting from thinking about yourselves as an insurance platform to a broader financial services company. Can you explain what that means to you? I mean, we're involved in insurance and financial services in different plays we're involved with, but I know this has very particular meaning to you. Yeah, we, we started our company as our identity was as an insure tech. Uh, we built all, all the products that we thought about was through that lens. And I actually think that's how legacy insurers think about themselves. They think about themselves as we are an insurance company. The way that we grow is through more insurance products. And that is how we started. Um, I think what we began to realize is we asked ourselves, what is the jobs to be done of Jetty Deposit? It's ultimately about saving people money or making renting more financially flexible. So we sort of extracted away the, the, the methodology of the product or the type of product, insurance, from the problem it was trying to solve, which is about affordability. And we made affordability the mandate and basically asked ourselves, what are the other products and services that we could come up with to solve that problem? And that's the, that's the company that's ultimately going to win here. Um, so it need not be insurance. We don't have to grow in insurance just because we have the infrastructure to do it. We should be thinking about what's the most value we could provide to a property? What's the most value we could pro provide to a renter in this specific problem set? And that's when we sort of expanded um, our view as to what we could potentially do as a company. It's such an interesting thing. When I, when I was junior in business, I didn't pay much credence to the concept of missions, having kind of a, a North Star. I mean, you kind of, my thinking was you knew what you were building, you had a set of customer needs, and you operated around that. What I've come to realize is there's too many opportunities when you find the right vein. And defining your mission is essentially drawing a dotted line around the opportunity set that you're going to chase. You know, at Interplay, we're, um, you know, at our core, we're a venture capital firm. But we define our mission as trying to do anything we can to accelerate, accelerate the process of an entrepreneur. Personally, I believe, I think it's very obvious to everybody, if you think about it, entrepreneurs by definition, or they don't succeed, are improving the quality of society. So that expanded our scope out to content, things like this that I'm doing mm. this podcast. This didn't make sense for me under a VC mandate. Maybe it was maybe argue, right. you could argue it was marketing. But we're not waking up thinking about just VC. We're thinking, how do we take friction out of the whole thing? Right. How do we make it easier for everybody? So this concept, while it may sound trivial to people about really spending time to find that mission, I think to a strategist, um, there is rubber on road where it does change the trajectory of a company. Uh, and it's a little nuanced, but it's practical. So it's interesting to hear you talk about it because it doesn't come up a lot in these conversations because it's frankly, for many, it's implicit. Okay, let me take a step back here. Looking at your bio, you're a highly educated strategy tech entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, it doesn't read a lot about real estate or rent. How'd you end up doing this? It was a bit of a windy road, but it started with a thesis around financial services. FinTech at the time in which Jetty was being started was sort of in the midst of a boom. Um, and it was very clear in 2015 that one of the main pillars of financial services that really hadn't been tackled yet was insurance. And so the question was, what is the insurance opportunity that I could see myself building? What lends itself to my skill set? What's the company we want to be? Where do we start? And I chose myself as the customer. Um, and I was a renter and I was buying renter's insurance, didn't have a good experience. Also recognize that renter's insurance was very much overlooked by incumbents. It's a lower premium product. It's typically treated as a cross-sell opportunity. Um, but when your margin profile changes because you can go direct to consumer, uh, that sort of changes the calculus. And that was the original um, sort of thesis of the company was that we were going to be the next state farm. And we were going to start with renter's insurance because it was this open direct-to-consumer opportunity and one that we could target a younger demographic. We then, in addition to selling direct-to-consumer, um, we realized that 
there wasn't a lot of it was difficult to build a moat when you're just competing in Google um, or competing on social. Um, and with a product like renter's insurance, where the premium was effectively capped uh, and it was quite low relative to other insurance products, if there was a lot of other people competing in the same channel, then your unit economics would erode. And so we were looking for other mm. channels to sell this product. And we also saw another trend happening, which was that now the 80% of the institutional real estate market require that renters purchase renters insurance before they move in. So this has gone from sort of a suggestion to a mandate just to be able to access your apartment. And so people were online looking for it in a way that they never had historically because of this mandate. Um, they were effectively checking a box, maybe not, not too dissimilar from auto insurance. You need it to drive. That's a regulatory mandate. This is a mandate imposed by a property manager, but nonetheless, that's why people were buying it. So that led us to um, this channel opportunity where we started exploring what would it be like if we went B2B to C. Then once we truly understood the needs of that audience, our eyes were open to other problems that insurance could solve. And in this case, a security deposit being the main one. Over time, that became our main product and we dropped direct to consumer because as we predicted, it became very, very crowded very, very quickly once other people identified the same opportunity. So that brought us in. It was really the channel that brought us into the real estate market. Um, and then once we were in it, we learned what are the other problems to solve and effectively became experts. Um, this is it. actually... A big insight because there's a lot of industries, a lot of companies we're involved with or we see, we're seeing where, you know, a huge chunk of their fundraising budgets kind of go to customer acquisition through the primary channels of Google, Facebook, and other. And everyone's knowing the cost of acquisition is going up. It's increasingly competitive and challenging. This is the first time I've heard of it driving a fundamental shift, not just in channel, but as a byproduct of a channel shift, shifting over the model. Yeah, which is fascinating. So I wonder if this is going to be actually be a trend as these markets are increasingly saturated, where B two B to C becomes more predominant as a result. Yeah, there's a huge thesis that a lot of VCs are following and entrepreneurs around embedded finance, which is how do you embed yourself in the purchase flow? Um, so mm -hmm. you could think about you know buying flight insurance when you're purchasing a flight on Delta.com. Um, it's sort of sitting in front of you. You're not going to go and buy flight insurance direct. Um, a firm is a good example. It's you know right in checkout. And I would argue that Jetty is a good example. It's in the flow of signing a lease, is checking the box for Jetty deposit, checking the box for Jetty renter's insurance, uh, checking the box for Jetty rent. Uh, and so we want to be where the consumer is. And we just think that that's the best way to build a defensible and sustainable business. Um, but yeah, I agree. Just bringing it back to your broader point, I think we started to realize that distribution is in many cases harder than product development, cracking it. What do you um, mean by that? So I think that while there are a lot of steps and potentially money involved in building, a, call it a renter's insurance product, um, and you could, you could sell renter's insurance through a lot of different channels, which is the channel that's going to work. Um, that actually is, I think, a harder problem to solve than building the product itself. And so that's actually the reason why we shifted to this model where now we think about our business as channel first. What mm. are the products and services that our channel wants and therefore our customer and how do we then build products around that? Because we have, a, mm -hmm. we have a belief that the more value, especially in a B2B or B2B2C market, the more value you can provide to your customer or your distributor, the higher the switching costs. And so it behooves us to not just think about what are the insurance products we could sell through this channel because we have the infrastructure, but what are the things that the channel needs because it's going to be a lot easier to sell. And by the way, there might not be other insurance products to sell. So we have to think about, we have to think about the world more broadly. And since we have this channel, 
How do we actually leverage it to the best of our abilities and increase the revenue out of that initial channel sale? It seems like it would also have important competitive dimensions to it, right? Um, you're in a fairly some, some level of commodity market, right? Um, having a channel strategy seems to be a way to create a moat. Can you talk about what it's like to compete in kind of a market with this level of competitive intensity? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about it in two ways. One is insurance oftentimes can get commoditized. Um, lending can as well. Um, and in a commoditizing market, you can use distribution as a way to differentiate. That's actually where we started. A lot of people had a digital first renter's insurance product and everyone was looking for a channel to sell it through. When, so, and that's one way to differentiate. So for example, you know, going direct, if your Geico is disruptive for selling auto insurance versus brick and mortar, like maybe State Farm historically, and that was the distribution was the differentiator. When it becomes a little bit more complicated is when you have the same product and you have the same distribution. So there are companies that we compete with for both of our core products, Jetty Rent and Jetty Deposit, where I would argue our product is better on a handful of accounts. But for the purposes of this conversation, let's just pretend they are all equal and we're, we're fully commoditized. If we both share a the same channel and we're selling it to the same distri uh, distribution channel, how do you then differentiate? You need sort of yet another way to do it. And my belief is that you do so with a broader value proposition. If you can go to the distributor, in this case, a real estate company, and say, I have five products that can make your life easier or better and your renter's life easier and better, and a competitor is coming with one, they are going to go with us because we are providing more value. And so that is actually our strategy, um, is to provide as much value to the property as possible vis-a-vis -vis our competitors who share the same, who might share the same product, might share the same channel. So this isn't a totally new concept. It's just um, an interesting reapplication of it. Instead of calling, I mean, you're calling the uh, building owner the channel, but if you were to call them the customer, Yes, having yeah, a more same. product feature set, right. And that's, that's a big concept here. People got pushed into channels, which are the embedded finance channels, which is a huge advantage. And that's leading to different scope of product set. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I think it's going to change the type of services coming through the system, uh, simply downstream or upstream, because uh, acquiring customers is expensive online. So interesting. Yeah. In our case, the, the buyer, if you will, the real estate company, or they, they are the channel. They're not purchasing the product, but let's just call them the buyer for this conversation. Um, these are companies that I would say have a ceiling in terms of what they are able to integrate as part of their leasing process. Um, to take to actually partner with a company like Jetty, there is overhead. There is a technical integration. There's a process integration. There's training. There's management of that mm. vendor. There's compliance. There's a lot that goes into it. And with the boom of prop tech, these real estate companies are being inundated with pitches on a daily basis. And let's just pretend that they wanted to use all of them. They can't. And so what they really are looking for are platforms, not point solutions, because they just don't have the operational um, prowess to or resources to onboard all these different companies. And so it is, I think it's really interesting to look at the companies who have been successful in this market. Let's look at the big property management software companies, Yardi and RealPage. They are constantly acquiring companies because they are in a, a value proposition race because they realize the same thing, which is they want, they, re they recognize that these real estate companies want to deal with as few companies as possible. So they want to do it all. And so that was, I think, as it relates to Jetty and our current market position, there, are, there is at least one company that has a flexible rent product. There are a handful of companies that have a security deposit alternative. 
but there there's obviously a number of companies that sell renters insurance through this channel but there is not a single platform that has all three and as a result when we go head to head with these companies we oftentimes will win so it's fascinating as i'm hearing you talk about it i'm having flashbacks to when i started in the business 15 odd years ago when someone would come in and pitch doing everything which is a mistake i've made in my own entrepreneurial side of my career it was a pretty negative signal and the reason why is i think it was so hard to build technology back then it was so slow onerous and costly that the odds of being successful in such a vast array of technology was low whereas today where a lot of the development's been streamlined you've got uh, better software programs you know you've got off the shelf tools the idea of and we're seeing a pattern of a lot of companies coming through who are building kind of robust suite solutions um, it's it's not crazy anymore. It's, it's funny, it, it, it's not something I plan to talk about today, but it struck me as you were describing it how uh, out of sync it is with the venture market of you know, just the turn of the century. Let me switch gears here for a second. You've got an interesting sure. story. I mean, in addition to Interplay, uh, you, you've got a bunch of great uh, venture firms on your cap table. Uh, you've got firms like Kosla, Ribbit, many others. What did you learn along the way that you could kind of advise entrepreneurs listening that has worked for you so well in fundraising? How have you been able to attract some of the best firms to get behind you and support the vision? Um, maybe I'll start with like how the, the original, our, our seed round and how that, that happened. Um, we, uh, me and my co-founder, we're building a thesis around insure tech and the way we want to attack things. And um, rather than build a pitch deck and go pitch someone in sort of the traditional way, uh, we reached out to smart people um, and VCs. We were not pitching for money and we were trying to get their take on, did they believe in this thesis? What could change? And along the way, we received a white paper that Ribbit had penned, um, which was effectively kind of like a call to arms, where are the insurer, where are the insurance entrepreneurs? And mm -hmm. it was very clear that we shared the same thesis around the fact that this was going to be a big market. And so we got in touch with them. And for about three months, we had a call um, once a month where we updated them on our progress and we shared our learnings. And I think what that allowed them to do is sort of see the evolution of our thought, how quickly we were coming up the learning curve, considering we were not coming from an insurance background. Um, they were pushing our thinking. And I think it became uh, a really interesting sort of test for how we could collaborate, how we could share ideas, how we could influence each other's thinking. Um, and so when the time came and we were like, no, we're actually going to go raise money. I think it made it a lot easier for Ribbit to say, we're going to lead this round and put in, you know, we're going to put in a check here, which um, I don't know, maybe in this market, if, if that's uh, necessary, but um, just given the fact that lots of things are getting funded very quickly. Um, but I think that that worked really successfully for us. Um, we have raised money from funds that we didn't know as well. Um, and I think in those cases, it really comes down to being clear about the story um, and tying the story into um, probably a broader story that you could imagine a VC is looking at. Because I imagine, and you can tell me if this is right, you're thinking about the world. You probably have a, a number of maybe individual ideas but you're also seeing broader trends. And so, and you're probably investing alongside those trends. Uh, and so if an entrepreneur is able to clearly articulate why they are on trend and why the time is right for this particular idea, I think it's a lot easier to get someone to come along for the journey and to get up to speed really quickly and pull the trigger. I love that story. And I, I do think the early relationship building with VCs is super valuable, uh, especially if you're working through concepts. It's also hard. One of the challenges, you know, as a VC, we're talking about this in the last pod we recorded. 
you get so many inbound from great people that you'd love to talk to, but you just can't make it work. It's, you know, at VCs love to think they're smart because they get the inbound. It's not because they're smart because they have money. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we've got all this inbound coming at us and you want to help everybody. At least I do. I'm sure most do. But you can't, you can't do 10 hours of meet and greets a day and still get your job done. Right. So there must have been something that triggered with Ribbit where they saw you guys. Maybe it was your background. Maybe the initial concept was close enough to the mark where they said, hey, we're going we're gonna to watch this one. We're already thinking about investing. So I, I do think it's hard for yeah. VCs to do the kind of collaborative thinking if they're not, if it's not kind of on track for deploying capital. It's, that's their job. Yeah, I think for entrepreneurs, it's also important to just be cognizant of signals about yourself and your company. Like, it's not just the idea that is the signal. It's all the other. There's probably dozens of other signals that are going to make you interested in focusing on one versus another. Um, it might be the company that you came from. It might be the advisor you have. It might be the way in which your deck is designed. It might be... There's there's many different ways to provide positive signals and some signals are stronger. Um, but I think it's probably worth entrepreneurs, especially maybe first-time entrepreneurs, thinking um, pretty seriously about what are all the signals that I have control over um, and how can I put myself in the best position uh, to get Mark's attention? I love that. It's good advice you're giving. It's good advice. Uh, now, you've taken uh, money from folks in the real estate industry as well. Yeah. Any pros and cons? I mean, this is a complicated decision for a lot of entrepreneurs out there about taking money from industry or customer segments. There's concerns about negative signaling or too much information access for future acquisition conversations. There's all these things that make people anxious. What have you learned about, you know, getting funded by existing players in the industry, not just institutional capital? Um, I've learned a lot about the process of doing it. Um, and there's definitely like a different pitch that you might tell to a strategic maybe versus a typical um, financial investor. And I think it depends on the market dynamics of the industry that you're pitching in terms of whether or not it's going to be a negative or a positive signal, um, or if it's going to um, hinder your ability to get a deal done with a competitor of your investor. I don't know if you're, if you're in a zero-sum market and you have two big strategics that are head-to-head and one of them invested in you, but you want to do a deal with the other, maybe that becomes a problem. In real estate, it does, it's not really a problem because real estate companies, while competitive at maybe a higher level, um, they don't really see themselves... It's not really that big of a zero-sum game. So an investment by real estate company A is not going to block real estate company B from doing a deal. In fact, in this particular market, I think that it just provides credence. But what it really does, and, and the reason why I'm interested in, in um, strategic investors, is because it's aligned distribution. If this means that we can now uh, get access to their apartments faster, um, then it's worth doing, especially if the company you're pitching has scale. Um, what it also does is it allows you sometimes to have more candid conversations with your customer. Um, so in our case, we can now go uh, to one of our investors who's also a customer and say, what do you think about this new product? Or why isn't our current product working as well with you guys versus others? And have more candid conversations such that you can learn faster. I love it. I think that's a big insight. The idea that the um, f- relative fragmentation or concentration of the market is a significant indicator as to whether or not it's insane to take capital from, the, from the, your industry. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, I'm a deep believer that innovation doesn't usually, most vast majority of cases, work unless it's improving society at some level. People don't pay, simply don't pay for services or goods that don't make their lives better. They just opt not to do it. That's the competitive dynamic enforces that. You guys are touching on a hot topic. Whenever I think about social issues or the narrative around the economy, 
and kind of the impact, I think the trends of society, housing issues come up all the time in the U.S. What is your perspective and the overall state of play of kind of the housing market, not in terms of whether it's going up or down, but social equity, um, access, things that we need on a social level? Yeah, so I think one of the main reasons why we find ourselves in an affordability crisis is just the lack of housing stock. Um, there is, it's, it's expensive to build a uh, new product. Um, and the amount of renters that are coming online are only increasing. Um, but the housing stock isn't keeping up. And so at the end of the day, that has made renting way more expensive. And so that's one, I think if, if you were to tackle this at the, at the root level, um, and maybe you are thinking about it on a legislative basis, it is how could we incentivize people to build housing, um, more housing, across the spectrum, across the country, different geographies, different classes. Um, from a technology perspective, um, I, there are a number of companies that have tried to lower the cost of new construction, but that is a huge hindrance to actually being able to get new homes online as well. Um, what One interesting thing that's happened um, that has affected our business is in a number of municipalities, um, you are seeing legislation being passed, which actually requires property managers that operate more than four units to offer a security deposit alternative to cash, um, because that is one way in their mind to help with the affordability crisis. You're giving people options with regard to how they want to pay. Um, so that actually has been a tailwind and a boon to our business, especially in those markets. But it's interesting to see how the public, um, um, how legislators and um, uh, folks that think about housing um, on sort of the government side are looking at the private markets to see if those folks can solve their problems as opposed to just doing it through legislation. Um, so I think just recognizing that companies like Jetty exist is a really sort of interesting uh, uh, sort of change, in my opinion, to uh, the way in which people, the, the way in which legislators are thinking about uh, affordability. Um, and so it's, it's, there's this interesting collaboration that's happening right now. Do you have any visibility into what the root cause of all this is? I mean, when you talk about housing stock being too expensive for folks, the market isn't always, but it's usually pretty good at balancing out so people can afford things and basic services usually get distributed at some level. In my, in, in my gut, and I don't have any expertise on this, I'm thinking may, maybe this has something to do with the mass migration from rural areas to city centers and land is the core cost or a driver of the cost that's popping it up. Is that even right? What, what, do you have any sense of kind of where the core of this comes from? Why is this a, why is this a problem? So there, Why is it more I, I think, affordable? Yeah, yeah. There's a number of things happening. Um, I'm probably not equipped to cover all of them, but one thing um, which is true is there has been since the '80s kind of an institutionalization of the multifamily and single-family space. It used to be very um, distributed uh, in terms of like the long tail, where you had lots of mom and pop owners. And you're seeing that now consolidated in financial players, private equity firms, REITs, banks. And part of the play is to effectively um, buy an asset, fix it up, invest in it, raise the rent, thereby increasing the value of that asset and probably flipping it. Some people long hold, but you're going to be flipping it. So I think the increase in rent, because, that, because this is a business model, is outstripping the increase in wages. And so mm. as the institutionalization becomes faster, and as the improvements to these assets become faster, 
combined with the fact that new housing stock isn't hitting the market at, to replace that the low cost units that it had once existed, you now find yourself in this pickle. And I think that's, that's what's happening in today's market. Um, I want to flip one more place here before we, we jump out of this. Um, we talked earlier about, you know, you become a real estate guy, real estate, a prop tech guy, but you're, you, you, can't, you were a serial entrepreneur and, and built agencies. And, you know, I think the agency thing is a big thing. Uh, it feels like it's not discussed enough as a training ground for entrepreneurs, right? A lot of people going through entrepreneurial programs or business schools, they're not waking up and all waking up and saying, hey, I want to go get the agency experience. They're going to consulting or banking or doing all this other stuff. But I feel like it's a great, great pathway. And I know you started your agency as you're kind of reloading between ventures. What did you learn from your agency days that helped prepare you as a founder? And, you know, would you recommend that entrepreneurs who are between or future want, you know, people who are interested in being entrepreneurs consider or focus on that as a training ground? Mm -hmm. First, I'll give my story and then I'll give you my honest answer on it. So, I started um, with my co-founder in Jetty, a agency which was basically, um, we were a sort of a ghost writer for pitch decks, uh, okay. where we would be hired by a VC or by an entrepreneur to effectively come in over the course of four to eight weeks and pull and, and, and craft their story for a series A, B, C, D, series deck. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to tell your own story. Um, and it was a very, it was a market that no one was really focused on at the time. Um, I had the skill set to, to do it. And so got a lot of business. It was, so the reality is that particular business actually did help me see a lot of different business models in a very short period of time. I had to come up the learning curve very quickly ask the right questions such that I could actually tell a story about a company almost as good as maybe the CEO would or help the CEO tell the right story. Um, and so that actually made me recognize trends between companies that were in totally different markets. Um, it also allowed me maybe like a VC to identify what are the types of companies that are being started now. So there was a ton of fintech. I learned about it through doing fintech decks. And that's when I started asking myself, you know, what are the other areas within fintech that really haven't been attacked? So in my particular case, I would say that because I was looking at new ventures, that actually did very much help me um, identify what I wanted to build next. More broadly, though, um, would I suggest that you know aspiring entrepreneurs uh, maybe pursue kind of a professional services like model um, before starting in their venture? I don't necessarily know that I would suggest that. Um, I was doing it not necessarily out of learning, but out of like financial need. Um, I could not have a job for a period of time as I was coming up with the business. Um, I think if that's the case, it's not a bad way to go. Um, but if someone has an idea that they are passionate about, that they think has legs, um, I would suggest getting started. Um, maybe different advice for someone who just wants to be an entrepreneur and is starting flat-footed and doesn't know where to go. It's a bit of a different problem. Um, but yeah, if someone wants to start a company and they have a general idea of where they want to go, I would just say start. So you can't tell me you're a pitch deck pro and not have me do a follow-up on that. <laughs> so can I get uh, top three tips you would give to listeners about creating pitch decks? Um, yeah, I haven't distilled it, although it's probably in my mind. Uh, one thing I would do is I would, um, rather than write the deck, I would write the story. Um, that you want to tell on a piece of paper on, you know, written form 
not in deck form. Um, I would then probably move that to um, headline sentences that you could imagine putting on different pages. Um, once you get to that stage, I would say, and so each one of those sentences should connect in a story. I would be use as few words and as few pictures as possible to try to demonstrate the words that are in the headline sentence. Um, most of the time, you can attest to this, um, a VC is probably taking three to five seconds to slide at least the first time through to see if they can get it. And if they can pick up the story, I think that's an effective deck. And then the, what becomes really effective is as an entrepreneur, can you actually speak to the slide and provide more information? Um, data to back up your story is critical as much as you possibly can. Um, and then the other thing I would say is there, there is a bit of a formula to a deck in the same way that there's a formula to a story. You know, there's a beginning, middle and end in a deck. There is, there is the context, there's the market, there's the problem, there's the solution. There's the how, there's the competition, there's the plan, there's the distribution. Like there are a number of different topics that you sort of have to cover to tell a cohesive story. Um, and if someone reads a bunch of decks, they will definitely start to see those patterns. It seems to me like you're a very well-trained consultant. <laughs> um, there are better consultants out there, but to do it for a couple of years. It was really great having you on. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thank you so much. This was fun. Really appreciate Mike taking the time. He's building a killer company. I'm excited to see what he does. Now, this is the part where I ask you to help out the podcast. If you like what you're hearing, please share with a friend, give it a thumbs up, put some stars against it. All of those actions help other people discover what we're doing here. I hope everyone's doing well, and you'll hear from me soon.